has been a, a, a distinguished uh, academic. He's a full professor of transport at the Technical University of Lisbon. Um, he's been uh, served as director of the MIT uh, Portugal Transport System uh, focus, focus Area, uh, chairman of TAS uh, Portugal uh, Consultants. He advised governments and international institutions on key transport projects and, and policies. Um, in 2015, uh, I, I believe you were appointed a member of the UN Secretary General's High Level Advisory Group on Sustainable Transport, um, which published a report uh, um, that, that year. Um, the ITF, I should say, is, a, is an organization with some 59 uh, mem member countries, um, administratively uh, associated with the OECD, but I think from a policy point of view, uh, yeah. independent. Yeah. And uh, I'll, I'll leave it to you to tell us what you're going to do, rather than my anticipating what it is we have a type of your shared mobility as a key instrument for better quality of urban life. So, thanks for the invitation. Um, I'll be speaking about shared mobility, not only because this is something on which the ITF has been a key player in bringing this to the discussion around the world, but also because Dublin is one of the three cities that has taken the step of asking us to do for them a study similar to the one we had published for the case of Lisbon. Lisbon was not politically involved in this, I just happened to have the data from my academic past with a letter from the mayor at the time saying that I could use the data for whatever research purposes I would think adequate. And this was certainly very adequate. So, this is our own entry. Let me just then briefly tell you about the ITF. This is an intergovernmental organization with 59 member countries. We just got two new member countries in our ministerial council last May, Kazakhstan and the United Arab Emirates. As you can see, we cover virtually all of the Northern Hemisphere with a few, few exceptions. We have vastly more than the OECD. We are administratively integrated with the OECD, but we are totally run by our council of ministers, who meets once a year in the summit, which is held in Leipzig. Ireland will hold the presidency uh, basically two years from now, starting in May 19. Currently, the presidency is with Latvia. This is a picture of the ministerial meeting in Leipzig. This is uh, not from this May, but from last, uh, the 2016 summit. This year, we had 1,400 people, mostly from government, um, NGOs, academia, and big companies. And it's a very high level political discussion around one theme every year. This year is governance of transport. Next year will be safety and security in transport. Let me now go to the theme. All of us are worried about the quality of urban mobility. It's one of the most permanent claims of citizens all over the world. People claim that movement in cities is difficult, is not pleasant. And if we want to sum it up, what should it be then? I'm calling it the new urban mobility paradigm. Some people are calling it mobility 4.0, just to copy the <coughs> revolution 4.0, the industry 4.0, whatever. There are three main aspects that I think have to be considered. High quality of service should be at the basis. We will all want to have mobility that is easy, pleasant. We need to have sustainability. And we need to have social inclusion. And as I will show you with some data from Lisbon, that this is found everywhere we now analyze it. Today, we have very poor situation <coughs> of social inclusion even in cities where public transport is good. And I'll show you why. All of this, sorry, all of this is something that we have a better chance now because we have information technology, intelligent transport systems available which were not available 10 years ago. So this gives a new possibility of development of new concepts and supplies. All the cities we look at have some issues in common. First one is congestion. It's always the first in the complaints of citizens. 
But then you have problems of accessibility in public transport. People complain. Air quality as well. It's always a problem, sometimes more, sometimes less. And then also, of course, road safety. These four aspects are always present in any mid-size or bigger city. If we look at what is the difficulty of replacing this, of changing from this, we find that the main barrier to change is the fact that over the last six or seven decades, we have grown our urban tissue and our own lifestyle in alignment with the car. We have reorganized the city and reorganized ourselves to be a good fit with the car. And so, if you try to do something to break that dependence of the car, that alignment with the car, you will face massive resistance. Massive. And it won't work. So what we try to do is to find a solution that allows you to still have essentially the same type of mobility by offering you in a more sustainable, inclusive, smarter way, all the predicaments that you have with your car, <laughs> but without having your car. Many surveys have been done around the world. What do you value most in your car? And the, word, the, 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 the words are not exactly the same in all different languages, but it's about convenience, availability. When I need it, it's there. And it's always close to me. And then it's relatively fast. And it takes me not exactly door to door, because I don't always find a parking place exactly at the door, but from this neighborhood to the neighborhood I want to go. No transport. All these kind of things. So we started our design around this concept by saying, what if we had something like a taxi. Insufficient supply that it will always come to you with very short waiting time and taking you to the destination. But then to make it more efficient, why shouldn't it be shared? I started working on this problem in 2007 on a rainy day. I was just outside my university campus going to a meeting of the MIT Portugal program. And many taxis were passing in front of me. 95% of them were one passenger. I was going to a meeting in a place where it is impossible to park, so it had to be by taxi. And public transport to go there is bad, so it had to be by taxi. And I thought, more than 50 taxis have come in front of me. It is not possible that none of them would be going in that direction. And this was the spark. Why don't we use IT? This was by coincidence one month after the iPhone had been announced. So maybe I was still under this impression of what the iPhone could do. And this was really what's motivated it. So let's see what is the new approach. And we start with something very non-technological, which is focus on access. Access of who to what? people to their jobs, to the public services, to social interaction, wherever you want to go. Mobility, just like transport, are not the objectives, they are instruments. You only move because the thing that you want is not here, otherwise you don't have to move. And if it is sufficiently close, you move by walking. You don't need a motorized transport solution. And it is amazing how you can change the formulation of the problem, of the technological problem, if you start by this simple enunciation. The key objective is to provide access. And I would say equitable access, and you will see in a few minutes how much difference it can make. The other one is to recognize that so many things will be changing in the near future. Electrification, the digital connectivity, automation, etc. So many things will be changing that we should be opportunistic and say, since you're changing a lot, use that turbulence to twist the thing a little to the side. 
I'll do a very bold maneuver now. <laughs> I hope this is after lunch, so it's, it's a bit risky. <laughs> but this is a small audience, you will forgive me. Imagine I want to turn 20 degrees to my left with my feet on the ground. I have friction. What happens if I jump and turn on 20 minutes around? The amount of energy required to jump or to jump and turn 20 degrees to the left was virtually the same. You see? As you are in the turbulence, you can use that energy that in any case will be done, will be deployed. But look, just a bit to the side. And this is the kind of concept that says this is only possible because those changes will already leverage a level of political discussion that you can add these little corrective elements and make it happen, make it possible. So reorganize the mobility system. Now bear with me a little because this is essentially about the combination of different things that we all know are happening. We all know these three things. Digital connectivity is already there, but getting further penetration, electrification and automation. They're not coming at the same speed at the same time, but we all recognize that within 10 years, most of our transport systems will be going with some component of this. Now let's see some implications. From electrification, you have lower emissions. Good. From the automation, you will have better road safety, good, but also a lower perception of in-vehicle time, because you will be using your time in the vehicle to do other things. From the digital connectivity, we already have today, visible today, preference for sharing and fruition, not necessarily depending on ownership. And from that comes something which is the attraction of right services, mobility as a service. Ubers and things like that. Now, because of electrification, we need to have a change in the fiscal regime of road transport. Today, no country in the EU gets less than 6% of the total fiscal revenue of the state <coughs> from fuel duties, or whatever the name of the different countries. The average is about 8. But no country gets less than 6%. 6% of the total fiscal income of the state is huge. If you have a ballpark number that the fiscal revenue of the state represents about 50% of GDP, this is 3% of the GDP, the famous 3% of Maastricht criteria. So no country is in a position to say, okay, but it's for a good cause. I'm losing 3% of my the GDP, I'm losing 6% of my fiscal income, but it's for a good cause, for sustainability. <coughs> you will not hear a single finance minister say that, because they need the money. So the money has to be collected, and in a previous research project I did for the Commission about six or seven years ago related to this, we went through all the sectors of society in Europe, and we saw no other sector is in a position to receive this burden on their back. This is huge. I mean, in, depending on the countries, this is either the number two or the number three source of income. It's VAT, personal income, and fuel duties. In all the countries. So, if this is collected on the gasoline and the diesel oil, essentially, and they are going out, what can you do? And this is an area in which I am very, very worried. And I've been speaking to a lot of ministers and people in NGOs. We must absolutely avoid that the decision on how to change this is falling exclusively on the finance ministries. Because if they do it, they will be looking only after the revenue and to minimize transaction costs. And we have a huge opportunity to do it in a way that is also good for the transport system. We need to have some change, some smart change in this. And I will speak a little about that later on. <coughs> Sorry, I went on the wrong error. If you connect digital connectivity and automation, you will have a much lower cost of professional ride services. 
In a taxi or a bus, just like on long distance freight, the driver represents typically around 50% of the cost. Depends from country to country, but from 35 to 65. It's always a very significant part of cost. So those things will be a lot cheaper. If you put these two together, it will become so cheap that you have to question, should I pay to have a car if I have one of these things always available? It's not like I whistle, but I do an app and it comes. The problem is that when you bring this together with a lower perception of in-vehicle time, a lot of people will say, well, since I can work, I will be living 120 kilometers from here. Or I can have a car take me to my job, then go home, take my wife to her job, then go home, take the kids to school, and then go run the errands and this and that and that. So very simply, by having these two things together, Vehicle kilometers, it's very easy to produce a realistic scenario in which vehicle kilometers double or are divided by two. Really. It depends on small political choices. And the key to this is vehicle occupancy. Share rights. Having more people in the same vehicle. And this can be fueled by the fiscal regime or road transport. It's the most powerful lever we have to influence vehicle occupancy, besides the good service, of course, and taking it to rest. So, let me tell you now about the shared mobility. We've simulated this for Lisbon, as the, the case is, and we're now doing it for three cities, Dublin, Helsinki, Finland, and Auckland, New Zealand. And we're in conversations to do it to two big cities, one in Europe, one in the United States. For the case of Lisbon, we tested what, were the, what was the relevance of the public transport system the offer we have. And we found that the metro should be kept because it has high capacity, high frequency, but none of the regular scheduled bus lines. All of them were less good than what we call the other taxi bus. So this is not to destroy public transport. This is to redesign public transport. What is a taxi bus? It's a non-scheduled service that responds to demand quasi real time. You have to walk to a stop, which are previously designated in the city. You have kind of virtual stops. You ask for a bus. You say where do you want to go. And the computer algorithm will match you with other people wanting to go along more or less the same directions. And something like 10 minutes before the time at which the bus is coming to your stop, you get a message saying your bus will be coming to this stop at this place in 8 minutes. <coughs> Please be there. This is the shared bus. So it's not door to door, it's street corner to street corner. The walking distance, the stimulation we did for this one was a maximum of 400 meters. Then the shared taxi, which is more conventional, if you will. It's a normal taxi service, you call it. And it comes, and it may be empty, and then with you on board goes to pick up or deliver somebody else, or pick up, in this case, if you're alone, or you may have somebody else in the taxi. We've designed the system with very strict limitations on how much could be the waiting time and the total lost time between the waiting time and the detour time. <coughs> to give you an idea, for the case of Lisbon, for trips below 5 kilometers, which is the vast majority of the trips in Lisbon, you would have a maximum waiting time of 7 minutes and a maximum wait plus detour time of 10 minutes. Which means if you have waited 4 minutes, you can have a detour of 6. But if you are unlucky to have 7 minutes wait, your detour will maximum be 3 minutes. No more than that. And with that, we get incredible results. That will be shown. So these are two segments plus the metro. We've kept the metro. These are the two reports we published. This one, 2016, Lisbon City, the core. This is 2017, so just published last May. Looking at the whole of the metropolitan area and including some questions about transition and also the service to people with mobility difficulties. And in both cases, we have great convenience. A 
as I've told you, we've, we've dimensioned the taxi supply so that you have very short waiting time and it's door-to-door -door service. No transfers. I forgot to say that about the taxi buses. Everybody gets a direct ride. In my earlier studies at the university, I have looked at a number of cities and I looked where is the market share of public transport lower. And without exception, this was the origin destination pairs in which you have two or more transfers. If the transfer is good, people can take one. But as soon as one of the two lines starts being irregular, ah, people start thinking, maybe I could use my car. Two transfers or more, only the people who have no money to even think about owning a car. The market shares are always very, very low. So again, on this thing, let's try to do something which gives people very good service. No transfers is an absolutely component, needed component. And then something which was not by design, but as a consequence, because we had very high efficiency in putting all this matching together, we got to very low prices. All of these studies are downloadable for free in our site. I would encourage you to read them. <coughs> but to give you an idea, for the taxi of today, sorry, the, top, the taxi in this system, the shared taxi, would cost less than 30% of what the taxi of today costs, including a professional driver paid with the Portuguese rules and all the legal constraints about working times and all of that. For the shared bus, it costs something like 40% of the ticket of today. But if you include the subsidy that is paid today and would not be needed tomorrow, it costs 26%. And you can say, what's the miracle? Simple. Efficiency. Occupancy. There's something that um, is important to understand. We've, we've had a very inspired idea that sometimes when you ask for a taxi bus, if it is in a low, an area of low demand or a period of low demand, it might be very expensive to send you a uh, shared bus, a taxi bus. But so what we did, we give you an upgrade. We promote you to business class, which means share taxi, and you pay the taxi bus price. Because from the supply side, it's so much cheaper to send you that small vehicle, and you will probably get another. It gets occupied with a much smaller number of people. The taxi buses, for the case of Lisbon, they came, the ideal size being eight seats for 80% of that fleet, and 16 seats for 20% of the fleet. But then, the very positive social outcomes. Emissions and congestion. The number of vehicle kilometers is reduced by something like 35%. So one third reduction. No other solution can bring so quickly such a reduction. And this is with the technologies of today. The other one, accessibility, I'll show you in the next slide. It's mind-blowing what this provides. It was the most surprising result even for us. And I think you will be impressed as well. Public space release. I think it was you over lunch who mentioned public space. You know how much of the, how many vehicles we need to put this in operation? In relation to the number, we have very detailed data for this. The percentage of shared taxis in relation to the number of vehicles that are used today in Lisbon on a daily basis is 4%. But each of these vehicles runs many more kilometers per day, of course. They are used in average 10 hours per day. And they do per day an average of something like 360 kilometers. They do, no, sorry, 260 kilometers. They do 90,000 kilometers per year. And this has another good effect, which is if vehicles keep on more or less the same duration in kilometers, the rotation of the fleet will be much faster. Because if you have to replace these vehicles after 200,000 kilometers, that's two years. And a half year. So new generations of vehicles will come much faster. But the parking space release is 95%. It's humongous. For the case of Lisbon, it means all parking space at the surface and half of the parking space in buildings. All the parking space is released. <coughs> at the surface. It's totally transformative. So imagine what you can do for pedestrians, for cyclists, for little plazas, even in some neighborhoods, 
you can redesign it to include there some social services which are not present in some neighborhoods today. Because the release space, for the case of Lisbon, which is a city of 86 square kilometers, the absolute number we got from this is four square kilometers of new urban land available that I hope will not be totally built. <laughs> but of course, temptations will be there. <coughs> and then, of course, affordability. I already spoke about it. At these prices, you don't need to subsidize it because it's so much cheaper than it is today. Now, accessibility. Look at this map. Lisbon has a decent public transport system. Not fantastic, but good. This map, we have several other maps in the report. This looks at how many, what is the percentage of the jobs in the city that are reachable by public transport within 30 minutes, starting from each of these little cells. We divided the city in cells of 200 by 200 meters. And you look at the situation of today. For those of you who are minimally familiar with the city, you will recognize that the dark red, which is the more than 75%, is more or less aligned with the metro uh, network. But the vast majority of the city is in the two lower categories. Less than 25 or 25 to 50. Why? Transfers. For instance, the United Nations or the World Bank has one index of public transport, accessibility to public transport. It says, what percentage of the population has a public, stop, public transport stop within 1,000 meters? It's not bad, but it's very weak. Because you may have a bus there, but the bus goes there, and my job is there. And so I have to go there and then transfer and go there, and if I'm a bit unlucky, I still have a second transfer. So in less than nothing, you're one hour away. Now look here. With the system of, this is only with the taxi buses, not shared taxis, just taxi buses and the metro. And you see that the vast majority of the city is on the 75% of the bus, and then the second crown, if you will, on the second category, and it's only here on this side. But it's lower, but here there's a problem, is that we were only counting the jobs in the city. In the, in this, in the report we have this here, it's the metropolitan area, and so these guys, they have few of the access to the jobs in the city because the jobs are mostly there. If you include the jobs in their neighborhood, outside of the municipal border, they're not as bad. So this is a question of border problem. Here. And this is how it looks. And what you see here is that direction is no longer an issue. It's distance. Why? Because the chef, the, the taxi buses, they go in your direction. Instead of in a predefined direction, they go in your direction. And that's the trick. Now look at this number. This is the 90th percentile divided by the 10th percentile. Let me put it a bit more in layman terms. If you do look at all the cells, the 10th cell with the highest number of jobs accessible within 30 minutes is the 90th percentile. The 10th percent best served. The 10th percent lowest served, so the one that has from the bottom in the 10th percent <coughs> position with the least number of jobs accessible. That's the 10th percentile. If you divide one by the other in terms of number of jobs today, 17.3 times more in the 90th percentile cell than in the 10th. With this system, 1.8. Now, that's a revolution. This is totally transformative. I mean, if 35% less congestion is good, this is miraculous. Really. I mean, if you, when, when we saw these numbers, I must say the feeling at first I was, wow. But then the second one was of shame. How can we have allowed the public transport system of Lisbon to be so badly serving so many of its population? Simply because we have not focused on access. We have been focusing on the productivity of the bus line. If you do these maps, if you start looking, and then guess what? Most of the people who do these calculations in the municipality, in the university, in the consultants, they either travel by car or they live here. <laughs> <laughs> so they don't feel the problem. If you don't feel the problem, if you don't study the problem, the problem does not exist. Right? And simply the way to ask the question leads you to this. For me, this is a map that brings me shame, because I've been working on this 
for 20 or 30 years. And I had never looked at it from this perspective. Even without knowing that this map was possible, this would be something that said, we are really not doing a good service to our citizens. Now, second instrument. So I said there were two concepts and three instruments. The first instrument is shared mobility. But it alone it doesn't work, or it doesn't work as good as you want to get to this new mobility paradigm. The second one is smart road charging. I already mentioned about this. The, the fuel bridges were a very smart thing to do when it started. Because they were not collected from each of you. They were collected at the exit of the refinery or at the port. So in terms of transition, transition, transaction costs, they are incredibly smart. You get a load of money and you charge four or five companies. That's all. And it's very difficult to escape because all the petrol is coming either from the port or from the refinery. If we want to do it smartly, we have to avoid that this is a decision, an exclusive decision of the Ministers of Finance. And we have to say, yes, we want to keep the revenue. Yes, we want to keep transaction costs low. But we want to have this aligned with the quality of service. People have to understand that they're paying in exchange for getting good service. But also to align it with the externalities they cause. So inducing alignment of individual behavior with public interest. Which, for instance, says if your vehicle is in shareable mode, even if by coincidence in this taxi you are the single passenger at this moment, it's not your fault, but the taxi and yourself, you are available to have other people come, it should be cheaper than if you're traveling with locked doors. <coughs> so this is much more than carbon pricing. It's carbon pricing and urban space pricing, if you will. And inducing people through the mechanism of the price of the charge or whatever you want to adapt their behavior in the social interest. And I must insist, please, let's help ourselves. Let's avoid that this is a decision of the ministers of finance alone. Hmm. And this is not easy to do, because they're very powerful guys, as we all know. And the ministry of finance will look at this and say, what is the revenue today? Let's get to another solution. So we will be charged so much per kilometer or whatever. So we have to be very vocal on this. Third one, land use planning, sustainable urban planning. And the key for that is that we have to look at this going from car oriented to people oriented, to access. Let's do those access maps. And that does wonders. And for that we need density and functional diversity. It's not density alone is not enough. If it is monofunctional density, it's a nightmare like we have in the suburbs of Paris. These huge social housing places with no jobs, no shops, no culture, nothing. And where people feel isolated. We need to have good design for the use of active modes, active walking and cycling, and we have to have quality of public areas where people like to have that space. And they are the main defenders of that space because it is so pleasant to have it. So this is the third answer. Now, what about shared mobility now? <laughs> I've told you that the study is now very advanced, and it was agreed with the people here in Dublin that we will start doing the details uh, after the summer break. And we already have some numbers in the office, but I've asked my colleagues not to tell them so that I would not be put into pressure of telling any numbers. <laughs> but I can tell you the following. The conditions compared to Lisbon, and both have been done at the metropolitan area, is that here you have a lower density and the higher market share of the private car, lower market share of public transport than in Lisbon. Curiously, the distances traveled are very similar in average, <coughs> but here there is less congestion, so the speed is a little higher than in Lisbon. This shows that there is greater potential for reduction of income to We had focus groups, so we did um, a focus group and then a stated preference survey. And in the focus groups, it came something that is very similar to Lisbon, which is that convenience and total travel time are key attributes for acceptance of shared mobility, uh, shared mobility particular shared taxi, by current car users. So we want to have a very convenient system, and total travel time should be not much more than what we have today. In fact, for the case of Lisbon, it's about the same. Even if you have those detours, you know what? 
because there is no congestion. So you travel faster. Even if you have a longer route, the total number of minutes is about the same. Cost is the key attribute for the current public transport users. So then something very interesting, which is for the people who were car riders, and if they're looking at going on a shared taxi, some of the questions were about how many people sharing the taxi with you? And they said, preferably many. We don't like to be in a small confined space with only one or two people because we might have to talk to them. <laughs> that's really, and that's sometimes unpleasant. But this raises a very interesting question. If you want to have, it's very easy for us in the model to have more people in the car. But that means a longer waiting time or a longer accepted detour time so that you have the time to collect the people in the car. So it may even be that in the end, the fine design solution has two segments within the shared taxi. The ones who favor the speed and the ones who favor the group size. And it may well be that say, okay, I, I want to have a very low probability of finding myself with one or two people only in the car. I want three and above. Are you willing to have another five minutes or six minutes in your waiting time and detour time so that we can amass more people to invent it? And if you are, okay, then it might even be cheaper <laughs> because if the vehicle is more occupied, it's more efficient. So, but this is something that inevitably will be different from one city to another. It is local calibration, and you don't even have to do it exactly right the first time. The market will find ways over time to do that. So it's now, the biggest thing, the biggest difficulty here for all this transformation is coherence. Why? Simply because there are many changes involved, many stakeholders involved, a lot of interested parties. And in many cases, there will be even government fragmentation vertically, national and local, and horizontally, Minister of Finance, Minister of Planning, I don't know the names here, Minister of Transport. So to bring all of these people to basically sing by the same songbook, it's something which is far from easy. And that's why I wanted to talk to you about more than just the shared mobility. It only plays well if you play all these instruments together. That makes it more difficult. And so, to conclude, we have common and different challenges. We should use the turbulence of the changes to do this thing that I did with my little jump. And then the coherence of the actions is critical. But then another dimension, which is coherence over time, is also critical. This is something that you don't do with one law in Parliament. This takes several years of a sequence of decisions and adaptations from the private sector, from the citizens, from the governments. And so we should address the short-term short -term challenges in a way that is compatible with the long-term, and particularly with climate change. We must not lose sight of that. But at the same time, the long-term challenge cannot be totally dominating, because otherwise, if you do not satisfy people in the short term, you lose your constituency. You will not have your team with you. So it's really being coherent transversally in time, but also longitudinally in time. And that makes it even a little more complicated. But that's why it's so fun to work with these things. Thank you for your attention.